I'm Niall Gagan. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in Berkeley, California, and I'm also a certified trainer through the Coherence Psychology Institute. My goal for this presentation is that once you've watched all four parts, you'll have not only a really good understanding of the basic ideas of coherence therapy, but also a really clear sense of what it looks like and feels like in actual practice. This presentation will be the prerequisite for anyone new to coherence therapy who'd like to attend the workshop that I'll be leading later this year in Sydney, Australia. It'll be the weekend of July 4 through 6, 2014. A link to registration for that workshop will be just below this video if you're watching it on YouTube, or it'll be available on my website, www berkeleypsychologist.org. As I mentioned, this presentation will be broken down into four sections. In part one, I'll be introducing some basic key vocabulary of coherence therapy, and then in part two, I'll go more in depth into some of the core concepts behind the theory. In part three, I'll be introducing a case example to start painting a picture of what coherence therapy actually looks like in practice. And I'll use that case example to demonstrate a number of experiential techniques that we use to explore and discover the coherence underlying any presenting symptom. Finally, in part four, we'll uh, follow that case example through to completion to show first how we integrate new awareness into the client's everyday experience, and then how we bring about deep and permanent transformation, which of course is the ultimate goal of therapy. Just one more thing I want to mention before we get started is that I'm not personally crazy over having slides read to me verbatim during a presentation, so that's not what I'm going to be doing here. But if you're the type of person who has difficulty listening to one thing while you're reading different words on the screen, then I want to encourage you to go ahead and pause the audio uh, as each new slide comes up. Then you can go ahead and read the bullet points, and then you can start it back up again and listen to my elaboration on each of the points. I think that's it. Let's get started with part one. Welcome, everyone. This is an introduction to the theory and practice of coherence therapy, which some people know by its previous name, of depth-oriented brief therapy. I'm Niall Gagan. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in Berkeley, California, and I'm a certified trainer through the Coherence Psychology Institute. All the material that I'm going to be using for this presentation is drawn from the original work of two therapists in Oakland, California, Bruce Ecker and Laurel Hulley. They're the originators of coherence therapy. This presentation should be a pretty thorough introduction to the basic vocabulary, the basic thinking, and the basic practice of coherence therapy, but there's a lot more in-depth material that's out there. One great resource is the website, www.coherencetherapy.org, where you'll find case examples and videos of coherence therapy and practice, links to supporting research, uh, there's a fantastic manual that breaks down the practice of coherence therapy step by step. There are announcements of upcoming workshops and conference talks and descriptions of training opportunities, including a few online short courses, which are probably the best way for beginners to get started and introduce themselves to the thinking of coherence therapy. Another great resource is the book, Unlocking the Emotional Brain, Un Eliminating Symptoms at Their Roots Using Memory Reconsolidation. This was published in 2010, and for those who aren't familiar with memory reconsolidation, it's a process that was recently discovered in neurobiology that, for therapists, is one of the most exciting discoveries in that field in decades, because it's the only known process for actually physically unlocking emotional memories at the synaptic level. Um, what this means practically for therapists is that we now know that there's a way to not just suppress, but actually erase unconscious emotional learnings that were formed either in childhood or in response to later life events. And the book gives case examples to show how not just coherence therapy, but a whole range of what I like to call coherence-focused therapies actually create the conditions for memory reconsolidation to occur within the brain. Another great resource is the book, Depth-Oriented Brief Therapy, How to Be Brief When You Were Trained to Be Deep, and Vice Versa. This was published in 1996 and is the original book on coherence therapy. This is actually how I personally got hooked on coherence therapy myself. It explains in great detail the, the theory and the practice of coherence therapy and fleshes that out with a lot of case examples that show not just how effective it can be, but also how fun of a form of therapy it is to practice because there's so much room for the therapist's imagination and creativity within the model. As I get started, I also want to thank my colleague Simon Dorsanya in Australia for his invaluable help with this presentation. Simon is a coach therapist 
who integrates coherence therapy with a number of compatible modalities, including Keegan and Leahy's immunity to change, internal family systems, and focusing. You can find more information about him at his website here. I'd like to start out with some basic definitions. There are a number of words that are used in very particular ways in coherence therapy that might have different connotations in other schools of therapy. So I'm going to take a moment to just define exactly what they mean in this context. Okay, the first of these will be the word symptom. Um, this can also be called the presenting problem or the target of change. Uh, simply put, the symptom is what brings the client into therapy. People come to us because they're consciously experiencing some form of suffering, right, in response to some form, some part of their experience, and they're looking for our help changing that. And in coherence therapy, it's particularly important that we come to an agreement between the client and the therapist right from the beginning as to what the initial symptom is that we're going to focus on. Um, almost any coherence therapy session is going to begin with the question or some variation of the question, what change do you want to bring about in today's session? Or what specific change do you want today's session to bring about for you? Just to give a few examples, um, you know, a symptom can be anything. It could be a client coming in saying, I'm depressed, or I feel anxious, or I just don't feel good about myself, I hate myself, or uh, I'm really trying to stick with my diet, but I just can't stick with it, right? I keep cheating, or I really want to be a good partner or a good parent, but I keep losing my temper, I keep raising my voice, yelling at my partner or my kids. This brings us to the next term, which is counteracting. Counteracting is a stance that many therapists hold. Uh, when presented with a problem or symptom, the reflex, and we actually call this the counteractive reflex, is to engage directly uh, at the level of that problem or symptom to try to fix it, to try to change it, to try to make it go away. Sometimes this comes from our training, and sometimes I think it's just as therapists or healers or people who want to help, we're predisposed to want to jump in there and fix it. So we'll take a moment to look at some common examples of counteracting. Uh, when clients come in with a presenting symptom of depression, uh, a common response nowadays is to engage in, have that client engage in behavioral activation, uh, getting clients to commit to engaging in an activity per day or maybe two activities per day in the hopes that that will get them up, out of bed, out of the house, and elevate their mood. Um, likewise, with the depressed client, um, another counteractive intervention would be to medicate the depressed symptoms. Hopefully we use this medication and it will just eliminate the symptom. Uh, likewise, if clients come in complaining of anxiety, uh, common interventions are to teach them relaxation skills like progressive muscle relaxations or deep breathing techniques that are designed to just make the symptom go away, make the anxiety go down. Um, likewise, when clients come in complaining of low self-worth, feeling bad about themselves, there can be a common urge to want to challenge what seem like cognitive distortions, challenge the self-deprecating beliefs, and point out to the client uh, that they may be seeing themselves through a, uh, an excessively negative light, um, point out that maybe they have more positive attributes than they are realizing that they have. Um, likewise, when clients come in wanting to change their substance abuse patterns, uh, frequently there's an urge to engage in some form of psychoeducation, either showing them statistics about what can happen to them or showing them a picture of a diseased lung to show that they should stop smoking in the hopes that maybe it'll bring up some fear and that fear will motivate them to want to make a change. And finally, when clients come in who uh, need some help drawing boundaries, standing up for themselves, uh, a common technique is to engage in some form of assertiveness training, have them do some kind of role-playing uh, in the hopes that they'll sort of role-play it here in the office, maybe standing up to somebody that they need to stand up to, and then they'll be able to go out into the world and uh, carry out the same behaviors that they've practiced in the office. So it's really important that I make it clear that there's nothing wrong necessarily with counteracting. Counteracting is not necessarily bad. And in fact, there's a place, there can be certainly a place for any one of the techniques that I described on the last slide. But at the same time, it's really important to be aware of what the limitations of counteractive techniques are. And there are two main limitations. 
The first is that by interacting just on the level of the symptom, counteractive techniques tend to not give the client any greater understanding of what was the root cause of the symptom. So for example, if clients come in with anxiety and they leave with a set of breathing techniques or progressive muscle relaxations that help them lower their feeling or decrease their feeling of anxiety, they're not necessarily any closer to understanding where that anxiety came from in the first place or why they were experiencing anxiety to begin with. The second limitation is that counteractive techniques tend to create a new set of neural networks that contain a new set of knowings, but they don't do anything to get rid of the original neural network that contained the original knowings. Let's say a client comes in with low self-worth. She feels bad about herself, or she feels that she's not good enough. And over the course of therapy, the therapist gives her reflections about herself that makes her start to feel that, oh, she does have some redeeming features or some good qualities. And she starts to form a new neural network containing new knowings that say, oh, I have positive qualities. I've got good things that make me actually a, a valuable or worthwhile person. But at the same time, that old neural network that says I'm not good enough or I'm no good still exists as well. Nothing is being done to eliminate that old neural network. The hope is that the new one will somehow be stronger than it, will suppress it, or will override it. But it leaves the old neural network completely intact. The next term that we'll take a look at is the word position. And there are a few different ways to think about what position means in the context of coherence therapy. Uh, one is to think of it as a, a distinct part of the client. Uh, a part of the client's psyche, or a part of the client's sense of self. And this, this part holds particular knowings or meanings about herself or about how the world is. Another way of thinking about it is that it's a perspective or a lens. Some might say a schema. And through this particular perspective or this particular lens, the client experiences herself in a certain way or experiences the world in a certain way. So coherence therapy distinguishes between two different kinds of positions. The first of these is the anti-symptom position. And it's called anti-symptom because literally the client comes into therapy anti the symptom. They don't like it, right? The client comes in saying, I've got depression. I don't like it. I don't want it. I want it to go away. Or I've got anxiety. I don't like it. I want it to go away. Or... The same could be said for any symptom, right? It's a problem. It's, uh, it's something that's just, there's something wrong with me, and I want you, the therapist, to help me get rid of it. So clients come into therapy very much anti the symptom. And this is the conscious uh, experience that they're having of suffering, right? At the depression, the anxiety, the low self-worth. It's making me suffer. It's painful. And that's why I want to get rid of it. So this is the, the, the position that clients always enter therapy from. So here's an example of an anti-symptom position. And you'll recognize this. This is the kind of thing we hear from clients all the time at the beginning of therapy. Someone might come in saying, my depression feels so bad. It's like a weight dragging me down, holding me back from achieving my potential. I keep asking myself, what do I have to be depressed about? My life is full of blessings. Many people are dealing with way bigger problems than mine, and they don't seem depressed. I keep telling myself to just get over it, but I can't. On the other hand, we have what we call the pro-symptom position. This is the position that we're looking for in coherence therapy. It's, it's the position that we're trying to help the client discover. And that's because the client comes to therapy with no conscious awareness of the existence of this position. From the pro-symptom position, the symptom not only makes sense, but is actually really important to have and to maintain. So let's look at a few examples of pro-symptom positions. And I chose these two because they highlight something really important. One might think, why would anybody want to stay depressed and unhappy? How could there even be a part of a client that would want to stay depressed and unhappy? It seems really counterintuitive from a certain point of view. But here are two pro-symptom positions for staying depressed and unhappy. The first would be this one. Mom is so depressed, and if I prance off to enjoy a full, rich life, then I'm just leaving her there suffering. 
And that would just confirm that I'm selfish and I only look out for myself. Or alternatively, my light, happy, and exuberant energy is what sets off dad's terrifying rage. It's not safe to get wild and crazy like that. But this heavy, subdued energy keeps me quiet and in my room and out of harm's way. So what you may notice about both these pro-symptom positions is that they both come from early life experiences. And in fact, in the context of those early life experiences, they probably were really true and really were important. But what most therapists have noticed is that once these neural networks get laid down and once these knowings get set in place, they continue um, years later, even though from an outside perspective, they seem like they should be archaic uh, or not apply anymore. They continue to guide or to define the client's experience of herself or of others uh, in interpersonal situations even though they've really long since uh, stopped serving their purpose. So this brings us to the final term that we'll be defining, which is the two sufferings. The two sufferings, of course, are the anti-symptom position on the one hand and the pro-symptom position on the other. The anti-symptom position is the suffering that the client consciously experiences due to the symptom. So in this particular example, it would be depression feels terrible. It holds me back from the life that I want to be living. But at the same time, there's the prosymptom position, which is actually an even more dreaded suffering that the client unconsciously fears experiencing if the symptom didn't exist. So in this example, it would be, but if I, if I live a full happy life while mom is suffering, that'll confirm that I'm selfish. And that light, playful energy gets me attacked. So I want you to notice that this, the, from this perspective, the symptom is actually a solution. It's the solution that helps the client avoid that more dreaded suffering. In this example, it's this last sentence, staying in this heavy drag down energy keeps me safe. Or with respect to the mother, it could be staying in this heavy drag down energy keeps me not selfish. So now that you know what's meant by certain terms like anti-symptom position, pro-symptom position, counteractivity, the two sufferings, we're ready to go deeper into some of the core concepts of coherence therapy. But before you click on the link for part two, I want to let you know that we've, for each section of this presentation, we've created a brief knowledge check as a learning tool. Uh, in a few seconds, a link will appear that'll take you to a number of questions that are designed to help consolidate your learning. While uh, there may be elements of coherence therapy that seem familiar to you, there are also likely to be elements that are either counterintuitive on the one hand or deceptively simple on the other as we go along. So I really want to encourage you to follow this link, check out the questions, make sure you've got a grasp of the ideas, and then of course feel free to move on to section two.